Okay, tonight we're going to look at Sodom and Gomorrah. You've heard things about that uh, story in the Bible. You've heard people say things like, if God doesn't judge San Francisco, then he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, we have to find out, is that true? You know, I've heard that many a time, and I've, I've heard that not just from one preacher, but many a preacher in many a different sources in many different places. But I believe that God says what he means in the Bible. Can you agree with that? And that he means what he says. That those are two different things, but they are both true. He says what he means, and he means what he says. So the Bible about itself says that it is the inspired, infallible, God-breathed Word of God. And so the Bible is its own best interpreter. If we want to find out something that God is talking about, the best way to find out what God's talking about is to look, what else, to look at what else he has to say about the same situation, the same topic. And therefore, let the Bible be its own interpreter. In fact, the word says that out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So you just can't pull something out of context and just assume that uh, because somebody thought it meant this in this one situation, that it means that in every situation, and that's what God really meant. You've got to look at the full context. I have with me tonight the uh, New King James Version uh, put out by Nelson Publisher, and this is the Spirit-Filled Life Bible. And I want to read you the footnote that they give on Genesis chapter 19, which is where you find the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, I do want to say that footnotes are not God-breathed. Footnotes are man-inspired. They are the things that, uh, that people think. They're what people think. And so they try to write their own. And every single footnote will be different from any other Bible's footnote because it depends on the author of that particular uh, Bible. So let me read you this footnote in uh, Genesis 19 on verses 4 and 5. It says, The men of the city wanted to abuse Lot's visitors in a sadistic, homosexual manner. Homosexuality is the only reason given here for Sodom's judgment. Jude 7 confirms it, although Ezekiel 16.49 adds further grounds. And homosexuality was to be punished by death. Now, if you had nothing else to go on, you just were reading through the Bible, you came across that, and you wondered to know uh, what was this story of Sodom all about, and you looked at your footnote, and your footnote said that uh, homosexuality was the only reason for Sodom's judgment. That's it, the only reason. Then you might take that as gospel and say, well, that's it, you know, obviously Sodom was destroyed because of homosexuality. Is that true? Is that the case? Is it, in fact, the only reason given for Sodom's judgment? Uh, if so, homosexuality was to be punished by death, they tell you. So would that mean then in today's society when we see a homosexual that a couple of Marines have absolutely uh, no question that they have every right to go into a gay bar and just beat up whoever's in there because after all, homosexuality should be punished by death because the Word of God is eternal. The Word of God has eternal implications, and it's as current today as it was when it was first written. So, uh, did, in fact, the men of the city want to abuse Lot's visitors in a sadistic, homosexual manner? Did that occur? Is that what was happening? Well, we need to find out, and the only way we can find out is to look at the story. As we look at the story, there are two numbers uh, in Strong's concordance, two words that I want you to take note of. Um, one is 3045, yadag, to know, to be acquainted. And the other one is number 7901, shakab, to lie down, and that word is used to mean homosexually, heterosexually, or in, a, uh, in bestiality. It means to ravish, to seize, and to carry away by force, and to rape. Now those two words are both in the Bible. 
in, uh, in Strong's, uh, we find out that this word yadog, 3045, meaning to know, is used 943 times in the Bible. And all but 10 times, it means to be acquainted with, to observe, to recognize, to have an understanding. I'll give you some examples of this word yadog when it is used. The word in, is used in Genesis 27, verse 2. It says, I know, I know not the day of my death. Meaning, I'm not acquainted with or I don't know the day of my death. In Genesis 28, 16, surely the Lord is in this place and I knew it not. I didn't know the Lord was here. That's what it means. Just simply, I didn't know. In Psalm 103, verse 14, God knows our frame. God's aware of who we are. God knows. He's acquainted with our frame. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 3. The ox knows his master. Do you think that means the ox has sex with his master? It means the ox knows his master. That's what the word means. In Isaiah 7, 16, the child shall know to refuse evil. And it's talking about Jesus when he's born. He will know to refuse evil. And Hosea 13, 4, thou shalt know no God but me. And as it is, we wouldn't have time, but we could look in Strong's and see all 943 times that the word know, yah dog, is used. And it means to know, to be acquainted with. Now, for some reason, people want to translate that word, yaw dog, as if it was the word 7901, shakab. Shakab meaning to lie down. Now, that word to lie down can mean for sexual connection. And if it is a sexual connection, it could be, based on its context, homosexually, heterosexually, or bestiality. But it also means to lie down for any purpose at all. It means to lie down for rest, like you were going to take a nap. It also means to lie down because you're dead, because of decease. And it also means to ravish. And some places that that word is used is in Leviticus 18, verse 20, 22, and 23. So that word is in the Bible. And if we can agree to the premise that God said what he meant, and he meant what he said, then if indeed the, uh, the people of Sodom wanted to homosexually molest uh, the, um, the visitors at Lot's house, then this word shakab should have been used because that's the word that would mean to, uh, to rape, to carry away by force, homosexually, heterosexually, or in a bestial way. Uh, that's the word. But that's not the word that's used there. We have the word instead, yadog. Now, let's go and look at this story. We pick up at Genesis 18. And I'm going to read, um, pick up with verse 16. The, so the city of Sodom, the story itself and the storyline, starts in chapter 19. But we're going to look at chapter 18 because we discover in chapter 18, look at verse 16, and the men rose up from thence. Now these men really are angels, two angels who were, and Jesus. Two angels and Jesus have just been visiting Abraham. And so these men it's talking about are two angels. And the men rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Verse 20. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they've done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me. And if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there are fifty righteous within the city. Will you also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are in there, that are therein? 
And the Lord says to him, no, I won't destroy the city if we can find 50 righteous people. What we've discovered that is before the angels ever get to Sodom, it's already determined, God already knows, he's already heard the cry of the wickedness of this city. And he's already determined not only the city of Sodom, but the city of Gomorrah as well. And that the city is so wicked, he can hear the cry of it, and he's sending his angels to find out if all this is so. And uh, Abraham begins to, to bargain with God, saying, if you find 50 there that are righteous, will you spare the city? God says, yes. Then he goes on in this chapter 18, says, what about 45? If you find 45, will you spare the city that are righteous? He says, yes. Then he says, what about 30? If you find 30 that are righteous, will you spare the city? The Lord says, yes. If you find 20 that are righteous in this city, will you spare the city? The Lord says, yes. And then verse 32, and he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet, but this once, peradventure 10 shall be found there and he said I will not destroy it for ten sake so now we're looking at a city that this whole city has got to be uh, completely wicked minus ten people if there are ten people who are good in this city it won't be destroyed so if the city of Sodom is destroyed for homosexuality then that means out of the entire valley that encompasses Sodom and Gomorrah, every single human being in that town has to be homosexual if it's destroyed for homosexuality, except for 10 people. So if there are 10 heterosexual people in that town, God will spare the city if it's being destroyed for homosexuality. Now we'll find out what's going on. Verse chapter 19, we're gonna hit Sodom. The angels come to town. And there came two angels to Sodom at evening. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, this is Abraham's nephew, by the way, Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he, borrowed him, he bowed himself with his face toward the ground, and he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, to your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and you will rise up early and go on your ways. And they said, No, but we will abide in the street all night. But he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned into him, and entered his house, and made them a feast, and baked unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they laid down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round about, both old and young, all the people from every quarter, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out to us, that we may know them. Now, some translations are going to say no sexually, no carnally. We want to have carnal knowledge. Ah, but it's this word yadog, to be acquainted with. It is not the word shakab, to have sexual knowledge to lie down with. It's this word to know, to be acquainted. Okay, 30, 45. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him. And he said, I pray you, brethren, do not do so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out to you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only to these men do nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. And they said again, This fellow, this one fellow, came in to sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now we will deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the door to them and shut the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. And the men said to Lot, Hast thou here any besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out, spake to his sons-in-laws, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get ye out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened uh, Lot, saying, Arise, take your wife, your two daughters, which are here, 
uh, lest you be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. And it came to pass that when he had brought them forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life, look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain, escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And uh, we'll go down to um, verse 21. Uh, and he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing, also that you will not overthrow this city for which you have spoken. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou come thither. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities that were grew up upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. So we'll stop there. Now in this story, we're going to have to look at some things. We need to find out, first of all, we first of all see in Genesis 18 that the city was already declared wicked by the Lord. Okay? Now we come to verse 4. And uh, we've already seen that Lot has come across these two angels in the gate entering Sodom. The angels have said, well, we're just going to stay right here in the middle of the town square and sleep here all night long. And he says, no, no, don't do that. Now let me bring you into my house and I'm going to feed you and I'm going to give you some rest and a place to sleep and, and then in the morning you can go ahead and go on your way. So Lot is offering hospitality according to the custom of the day. In verse 4 it says, but before they lay down, now I want to point out some words, so we'll go a little slow here. Before they lay down, before the angels went to bed, before everybody went to bed, the men of the city, now the word men does not mean men. It's number 582 in Strong's, and 582 is where it says the men of Sodom, is this word enosh, and it does not mean male humans. It does mean mortals. So a proper translation is to say, but before they lay down, the humans and the mortals of the city, even the mortals of Sodom. Again, 582. Compass the house round about, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. The word people, 5971. All the people, meaning all the women and the men, and all the mortals, and all the, the humans. So we are seeing that we're not talking about a crowd of homosexual men but we are talking about a crowd of every living human being that lives in this city. The men, the women, the children, all the people. Look at verse 4 again where it ends. All the people from every quarter. So you see that every citizen, female, male, children, all of them are there. So now what you've got is a mob scene. Now, is this a mob scene of all homosexuals? Well, some people say absolutely. Well, we'll have to look. So we see that we have mortals here. All the mortals are there. And they call, verse 5, unto Lot, and they said unto him, where are the 582? Again, the mortals. In other words, the people of the town show up at Lot's door and they don't know whether Lot has men in his house or whether he has women in his house. They say, where are the mortals, where are the mortals which came into thee this night? All they know is that Lot's got somebody in his house. And they don't know who it is. And so they say, bring them out to us that we may, your dog, to know to be acquainted with them. Now, if indeed this word is supposed to be used here to mean sex, why are all the women and the men and the children saying, bring out these mortals that we don't know whether they're men or women so that we can have sex with them? It doesn't make much sense, does it? Have you ever seen that in human history? 
a crowd of women and men, a whole town, a whole mob in an uproar, banging on someone's door saying, bring them out that we can have sex with them. Whoever it is in your house, we don't care if it's a male or a female, bring them out, we want to have sex with them. Have you ever seen that in human history? Have you ever seen this? A cross burning in someone's lawn, people in hooded jackets, someone perhaps from New York City having moved to Selma, Alabama and having accepted in one of his friends into his house and they never did trust that New Yorker to begin with and now they're not sure who is it that they brought in and they think that, that, that the race of that person is unacceptable and they don't know who is this stranger and they bang on the door with the cross burning and they say you bring out whoever it is that's in your house we want to know who it is. Isn't that more likely in the human behavior that's happening here, not meaning we want to have sex with them, nor does it mean we want to be acquainted, oh, we would just love to have a little, sit down, have a cup of coffee and a piece of pie and get to know them. They're, they're in a furor here. So this mob is having a fit and they want to know who's in the house. And Lot goes out to the door and he shuts the door after him and he says, now I pray you, do not do so wickedly. Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. Now the word man here is not 582 mortals. It's the word 376, man. It means a male person. So if indeed the, it was men who of Sodom who were at the door, then the Bible would have used the same word it just used here that his daughters didn't know a man. And so it would have used 376 in Strong's, meaning a man. So it never used that. It used the word mortals. The mortals of the city are there, not the men of the city are there. Since the mortals of the city are there, banging on the door, and now he comes out and says, now why don't you just go ahead and have my daughters uh, who have not known a male person, a man. They've never had a husband. They've never been to bed with a person. I pray you... I bring them out unto you and do ye to them as is good in your sight only to these men 582 again mortals the angels do nothing for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof now here's an interesting thing Lot is now offering to this crowd his daughters it says in 2nd Peter chapter 2 and you might want to turn there. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6 to 8. And here's what it says. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example to, unto all those who should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. So the Bible declares that day after day after day after day that Lot lived in the city of Sodom, he heard their conversations. If you lived in San Francisco in the Castro district and you listen to the conversations of the gay population there day after day after day after day and all of a sudden your gay neighbors were mad and furious and enraged with you banging on your door and demanding that they know who's in your house Having heard their conversations day after day after day, would you make a logical assumption that you could appease them by giving them your daughters? These gay men who are out there enraged wanting to have sex with your visitors. Would you have made the logical connection if you've listened to their conversation day after day after day? It says that he was vexed in his soul, seeing and hearing, in his righteous soul day to day to day to day. So there is something that was going on in Sodom day after day after day that made him realize, well, he could offer his daughters and it would quiet down this group. Women and men, the mortals of the city, and the Bible said all the people. And he thought if he would push his daughters out there that this would quiet down all the mortals of this city. Now, are these gay men who are going to be so uh, quickly appeased by two daughters coming out? 
if in fact they were determined to have sex with, this, this, uh, with these visitors? There isn't any logic when you're reading it in, in the reading the Bible. So you see the traditions of men make the word of God of none effect. Okay, also, I want to point out something else in verse 6 of 2 Peter 2. It says that they returned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making an example unto all those who should live ungodly. The word ungodly in Greek, because we're in the New Testament now, is 764 in Strong's in Greek. And this word really shouldn't be translated correctly as ungodly as much as it literally is translated without worship. And so he condemned them with an overthrow making an example to all who would live without worship. That's what the Bible is literally saying. So we see that Sodom was destroyed as an example for every group of people from that point on who would live without worship. Worship of the true and living God. Not worship of demons, but worship period, but worshiping of God. So Sodom was a town that did not worship God. Okay. Now, we hear we hear, um, it, and it said that they today, in verse 8, he saw their lawful, unlawful deeds. So these people were daily lawbreakers. Now, many times in your footnotes, when you're reading your footnotes about Genesis 19, it will tell you, see the similar story in Judges 19. Because then it's assumed by tradition that it, you can then understand that uh, obviously homosexual activity was taking place in this town also and therefore God judged them also and they, you can see that boy these people were in big trouble. But if we look at Judges 19 and we look at that story, first of all this story is not about Sodom because Sodom doesn't exist anymore. It's now gone. It is about a city called Gibeah. Gibeah is a city, a town, that belongs to the tribe of Benjamin of the nation of Israel. In other words, Gibeah is about God's people. A city that belongs to God's people. So we, we have to be aware of who we're talking about when we look at any of these, of these stories. So Judges 19 is the story of a man whose wife ran away, went back to her dad. He goes to get his wife and to bring her back home. Stays at his father-in-law's house several days, eating and drinking and enjoying his father-in-law's company, and then decides to saddle his donkey, take his wife back home, and it gets late at night. And they could stop in the town of the ungodly, the Jebusites, but they decide, no, we'll not stop to stay the night in the town of the Jebusites. We'll go on to God's people. We'll go on to Gibeah. And certainly when we get to God's people, when we get to Gibeah, then we'll find a place to, to stay down, to sleep for the night, to have some rest and whatever. And they realize, they even say that they've got plenty of uh, straw and food for the ox and, or for the, uh, for the donkeys and everything else that they've got with them. They don't need to be an imposition on anybody. All they need is shelter. So they get to this town and uh, verse 18 of Judges 19 says uh, the man now is talking about um, uh, I'll pick up with verse 17. There's an old man who comes, uh, sees them sitting in the, in, the, in the square of the town, just like the angels were in, the, in Sodom. Verse 17, when he lifted up his eyes, he saw a wayfaring man in the street of the city, and the old man said to the traveler and his, his concubine, Whither goest thou, and whence comest thou? And he said unto him, We're passing from Bethlehem, Judah, toward the side of Mount Ephraim, from thence am I, and I went to Bethlehem, Judah, but now I'm going to the house of the Lord, and there is no man that receives me to his house. So the traveler is saying, nobody's going to let me stay in their house all night. 
And he says, yet there's both straw and provender for our donkeys and there's bread and wine also for me and for my handmaid and for the young man that's with the servants. There's no want of anything. And the old man said, peace be with you. Howsoever, let all your wants lie upon me. Only lodge not in the street. Don't stay out in the street and don't worry about what you need to eat. You let all your needs be taken care of by me. I, you come to my house, the old man says. So he brought him to his house and gave provender unto the donkeys and they washed their feet and did eat and drink. Now as they were making their hearts merry, <laughs> behold, the men of the city, uh-oh, here's that word men again. Is it the men? Uh-uh, it's 582. It's the mortals. The mortals of the city, certain sons of Belial, sons. The word for sons is 1121. It doesn't mean sons, it means children, descendants, members of a group. Okay? So certain children of Belial. Now who are, who's Belial? What does Belial mean? Belial in the Hebrew in Strong's is 1100, and it means literally good for nothing, wickedness, or destroyer. Who is the destroyer? Satan is the destroyer, right? In fact, Belial in Hebrew is a proper name for Satan. You might as well say, because it is saying, certain descendants or certain children of Satan or certain members of a group of Satan. That's what that's saying. So now we're really, it's really saying that the mortals of the city who were descendants or children of Satan beset the house round about and beat at the door and spoke to the master of the house, the old man, saying, bring forth the man that came into your house that we may know him. Know him. Again, Yadog. 30, 30, 45 in Strong's. We want to know him. Now, let me ask you this question. The Bible will show us what the man who was traveling with his wife thought they meant when they said, bring him out that we may know him. And we will discover whether he felt they meant they want to have sex with him or something else. In chapter 20, verse 5, he's telling his story, this nightmare that he endures. And he says, and the men, now this is a different word for men. This word for men is 1167. And it really doesn't mean men as in plural male people. It really means the word Baal or Lord. So the Lord or the Baal, Baal is a god. The God of Gibeah, not meaning God like Yahweh, but God like Satan. The master of Gibeah is what that's literally saying. Rose against me. In other words, there was an outright satanic attack against me. And we see that so because we know that these were children, descendants of Belial, members of the group of Satan. And he says, so the master of Gibeah rose against me and beset the house round about upon me by night and thought, does it say, and thought to have had sex with me? Does it say in verse 5, and he thought to have knocked on the door and saw if I was available for a little fling? It says that he thought to have killed me. He realizes why those people are outside there. They have one thing in mind, and it's murder. Murder, not sex. So there's no homosexual activity involved in this story at all, but in fact, there is a story of a man about to be murdered, about to be killed. He says so, and he was there, and he would know what they had in mind because he saw them banging on the door. And the, um, so they say in verse 22 of chapter 19, back to the storyline. So they spoke to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring forth the, the man that came into your house that we may know him, meaning that we might kill him. 
They're saying to the old man, we want to know who it is. We want to be acquainted with who you've got in your house, but their intent is to murder the man. It's a mob, and the mob is enraged. They're furious. And he knows it because he says, they thought to have killed me. So it goes on, and the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said, don't do this. Don't be so wicked, seeing that this man is come into my house. Do not do this folly. Behold, here's my daughter, a maiden. Now, these are a bunch of homosexuals again that he's offering this woman to. And his concubine, the man's bride that he went to go and get. Them I will bring out now, and humble ye them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you. But unto this man do not so vile a thing. But the man would not hearken to him. So the man took his concubine and brought her forth unto them. And they knew her and abused her all the night until the morning. And when the day began to spring, they let her go. Now, these are Satanists. They're not gay men. And these Satanists abuse this concubine all night long. Then the woman in the dawning of the day fell down at the door of the man's house where her Lord was until it was light. And her Lord rose up in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way. And behold, the woman, his concubine, was fallen down at the door of the house and her hands were upon the threshold. This is a tragic scene. And he said unto her, Up and let us be going. But there wasn't any answer. If we read on, we find out she's dead. They abused her all night long and killed her. They murdered her. And so he takes her home and divides her corpse into 12 pieces and sends one piece to each of the 12 tribes of Israel so that then war is brought against the city of Gibeah. And the city of Gibeah is destroyed. And that's why in chapter 20, verse 5, he's telling his story. He's saying that the master of Gibeah rose against me and thought to have slain me. And my concubine, have they forced that she is dead? So when people say, if you don't believe that Sodom and Gomorrah is a city of homosexuals, just look at Judges 19. Well, look at Judges 19, and you see that it's a city of Satanists, a city of people who, 2 Peter says, are without worship. A city of people who have forsaken God, have nothing to do with God, are without worship, do not worship God, but are children of Satan, members of a group of Satanists. That's what we've got. Now, let's find out, going back to Genesis 19, pick up with the story at Sodom again, and see what is going to happen. How determined are these people in Sodom? How determined are they to murder the angels? Let me ask you a question. Do you think Satan knows when an angel shows up on the scene? And if Satan has got a town in its control, so much so that God says, this is a wicked city. And if I can't find even 10 righteous people in that town, I'm going to destroy this city. The city is completely under the dominion of Satan. These Satanists who are controlled by Satan realize, or the people themselves might not realize, but Satan realizes two angels, messengers of God, have just showed up. Just showed up. And they think the same thing that they thought when Jesus showed up on the scene. What did Satan think when Jesus showed up on the scene? He thought what the parable was that Jesus told, that when the owner of the vineyard goes to the vineyard to get the fruit for himself, the, the renters in the vineyard say, here is the son, let's kill him and the entire planet will be ours. And so here now, is what they did. They, when, when Satan saw Jesus be born, he sent Herod to kill all the baby boys under two years of age in Bethlehem so that there couldn't possibly be the Son of God to redeem the human race. When Satan failed in that trick, he waited until Jesus went out into the, t into the wilderness and he said, why don't you try to, you're the Son of God, why don't you jump off the, the pinnacle? 
Satan kept coming and coming and coming again and again and again to destroy the Son of God because he kept thinking if he could crucify him, kill him, in some way wipe out his life, then the whole planet would belong to him. Well, Satan has never changed. And so uh, that's why Satan gets the whole mob, the whole crew of people who had been healed by Jesus. He healed them all. The same group that had been healed by by Jesus, those same people who yelled, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, those same people to scream and yell, crucify him and give us Barabbas a murderer instead. Satan operates that way. So Satan sees in Sodom that God has just sent two messengers and he knows his time is up. He's got a good thing going in this town called Sodom and this other village called Gomorrah. He knows that he rules, he reigns, those people are without worship, they're completely under his dominion. And he's determined to kill these angels because if he can kill and wipe out these angels, then he knows that God's purpose will be thwarted and he can continue on running the show. Do you see that? So we look at, pick up again, verse 9 in Genesis 19 in Sodom's story. And they said, stand back. And they said again, this fellow came in to sojourn. He, this guy came in to live among us, and he will now be our judge. Now we're going to deal worse with you than with them, meaning the angels. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. Now, they're determined to get to those angels, absolutely determined to get to those angels. They're, in fact, hell-bent on it. And it says, but the men, meaning the mortals who are the angels, put forth their hand, pulled Lot into the house to them, and shut the door. And then they smote the mortals that were at the door, the men and the women, the children, all the people. They hit everybody in town with blindness both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. Let me ask you this question. If you were determined to have sex with a person, and you, just, you were just very amorous, and they just had you turned on, you were just excited, you were at the point of climax, and you're just absolutely going to have, you were determined you were going to have sex with this person, and they slammed the door in your face. Now, you're just as still determined you want to have sex with them because that's what people say is happening in Sodom. They say this is a city of homosexuals and that's why God judged it because it's all homosexuals and they were going to have homosexual sex with these angels. If that's the case, in your own sex life, if you were about to make love to your mate and suddenly you were hit with blindness, what do you think would take precedence in your life? The blindness or the desire to have sex? What do you think would get your attention? And all of a sudden, these people, not just men, the mortals of this town are struck with blindness. And what does it say? They wearied themselves to find the door. They are obsessed with getting those angels, getting those angels. They're not interested in sex anymore. They were never interested in sex. They are interested in the one hell-bent purpose that the the ruler of that town is forcing them into. And Satan doesn't care that the angels have hit those people with blindness. He wants those angels dead. And so now that all the people, the men, the women, the children of town are all blind, they should normally stop and go, oh my goodness, I can't see what happened here. But no, they are wearying themselves, scratching at the doorpost, still trying to get to the door. In fact, they do it all night long because it's not until the morning that the angels take Lot, take his wife, take his daughters, and tell them to leave town. So all night long, they're still clawing, scratching, biting, trying to find the door, trying to find those angels. Now that doesn't sound like any kind of sexual encounter to me. Pretty bizarre, if it was. <laughs> blind people been just struck with blindness and the only thing they can think about is get them angels, get those angels, get those angels. That's not sex. And it's certainly not a story about homosexuality. It is a story about satanic oppression of a town. So therefore, verse 13, the angels say 
get out of this town for we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. No wonder God sent it to be destroyed because it's a wicked, wicked, satanic filled town. Now, did Sodom have Satan worshipers? 2 Peter 2 verse 6 said that it was an example for everyone who from that point on would live without worship. And you can't ride the fence. You have only one God or another. You either serve God Yahweh or you're serving the God of this world. And they were without worship. They were not serving the God Yahweh they were serving the God of this world. That's the problem. Now, let me give you some more evidence because that just sounds real good. I think I've got everyone here convinced, but let's see what the Bible says still yet more. The Bible gives more references yet about Sodom. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 32 Sodom is mentioned, but by the time the book of Deuteronomy is written, Sodom does not exist, so we know that God's not talking about the literal town of Sodom. Sodom's been wiped out. It's long gone. That happened in Genesis 19. Now we're into Deuteronomy. We're into the Exodus. Israel's coming out of, the, out of Egypt, and they're getting the word of the Lord. And God comes along in chapter 32, and he makes reference to Sodom, but he's not talking about Sodom, he's talking about Israel. And so he's comparing the two. Chapter 32, verse 32, and it says, for their vine is the vine of Sodom. Whose vine is the vine of Sodom? Israel's vine is the vine of Sodom. And their fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall, their clusters are bitter. Now, to see that this is Israel he's talking about, and he's comparing Israel to being just like Sodom, he's saying, read that again, that their vine is the vine of Sodom. He's saying, now, you know, Israel is from the same vine as Sodom. And the same vine, so you know, if you're from the same vine, you're definitely connected. It's the same thing. It's the same plant. And so God's saying, Israel, here's who you are. And he takes, look at verse 5, and he says, here's what they're like. Now he's talking about Israel. He's not talking about Sodom, but he's comparing them as the same thing. Verse 5 and verse 6, they have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. They are a perverse and crooked generation. Now he's talking about Israel. Do ye thus requite the Lord, O foolish people and unwise? Is not he thy father that hath bought thee? Hath not he made thee and established thee? Look at verse 15, 16, and 17, chapter 32. But Jeshurun, one of the uh, tribes here, the, uh, waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness, then he forsook God which made him. Oh, so Israel forsakes God which made him. They are now without worship. They forsook God which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils. So now you see that we're talking about a town, Sodom, that was demonic. And Israel is becoming the same thing. Sacrificing unto devils, not to God. To gods, small g, whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. So now Israel's under the same condemnation because they're doing the same thing, worshiping devils, worshiping devils. So we see that when the uh, sons and the people of Gibeah 
are called children descendants of Belial, meaning descendants of Satan, God means exactly what he says. He says what he means, and he means what he says. And he says they're Satanists. That's what he's saying. Now, that's not the only place that Sodom is mentioned in the Bible. In Isaiah chapter 1, the uh, Israel is again compared to Sodom. And it says in verse 10, well, I'll just read you um, verse 1, Isaiah 1.1. 1, 1. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning, so you know that we're not talking about Sodom, we're talking about Israel, concerning Judah, Jerusalem, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So he's talking about Jerusalem, he's talking about Judah, okay? This is the vision that this prophet Isaiah saw concerning them. Verse 10 says, Hear ye the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. So he's very clearly saying, Jerusalem, listen to me, you Sodom. Okay? Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. Now, is he talking about the literal town of Sodom and Gomorrah? No, they've long been under the Dead Sea. They're long washed away. They don't exist anymore. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts and delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity. It is even the solemn, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feast, my soul hates. They are trouble unto me. I'm weary to bear them. When you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well. Seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. So God's saying, Jerusalem, you're just like Sodom. So stop all your worshiping me because it's not me. I'm not even listening to what you're doing. All the evil and the wickedness that you're doing is just an abomination to me, he's saying. And he says, here's what you need to start to do if you want to get right with me. Now he's saying this to Jerusalem, but calling them Sodom. And he's saying, Sodom, here's what you need to do. Verse 17, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Now, turn to Ezekiel 16, 48. Because here God finally spells out why he was mad at Sodom. In Ezekiel 16, 48 to 50. As I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom your sister, he's talking to Israel again, has not done she nor her daughters as you have done, you and your daughters. Behold, now I think if the word says, behold, this was the sin of Sodom, I think you can trust that this was the sin of Sodom. Don't you? I believe God means what he says and says what he means. Behold, this was the sin of your sister Sodom. We're listing them here. Pride, number one. Fullness of bread, number two. And abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. And they were haughty and they committed abomination before me. What's abomination mean? Abomination is 8441 in Strong's and it always means idolatry. They committed idolatry. Did they? Well, they worshiped devils, didn't they? And they were without worship of God. 
So they committed idolatry before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. Now, what does that mean then when we come into the New Testament? Jesus makes a reference to Sodom in chapter uh, 10 of Luke. In Luke 10, I'm going to read you verses 3 through 12. Jesus makes reference to Sodom. Verse 3. He's talking to his disciples, who he's sending out now to do the works that he commissions them to do. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes, and salute no one by the way. And into whatsoever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. <clears throat> if not, it shall turn to you again. And in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give. A little hospitality here. For the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. And into whatsoever house you enter, and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. And heal the sick that are in there. And say unto them, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. But into whatsoever city you enter, and they receive you not. Uh, like Sodom wouldn't receive angels. Like Gibeah wouldn't receive the man from Bethlehem. And they receive you not. Go your ways out into the streets of the same, and say, Even the very dust of your city which cleaves on us we wipe off against you notwithstanding. You be sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come near unto you. But I say unto you that it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. Why? Because Sodom, behold, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters, and she didn't strengthen the hand of the poor or the needy. She didn't offer any hospitality. They were haughty. They were haughty. They wouldn't, they didn't see any need to be helpful. They didn't see any need to take care of folks. They didn't see any need to offer hospitality in a time in history where without hospitality and the protection of a city, you were not only uh, opened up to robbers and to thieves, but also to lions and bears and wild animals and beasts that would just as likely devour you and your uh, uh, donkey as not. And you needed the protection of the city. And so you were just as much committing murder as you were anything else by not giving hospitality to someone. Jesus was saying, if they won't take you in who are my disciples, it'll be worse on them for not taking you in, my disciples, than it was in Sodom, not taking in my messengers, my angels. So in hospitality, along with pride, fullness of bread, meaning they had a good income. They were rich folks. And they had abundance of idleness. And the word for idleness, uh, 8253 in Strong's, is an attitude. And it means live and let live. Don't bother me and I won't bother you. So in other words, a stranger shows up in town and they've got this idle attitude of, you know, well, it's tough. You're in town and, you know, you're in town for a week. That's just tough. Don't bother me. I won't bother you. You leave me alone and I'll leave you alone. You let me live. I'll let you live. I'm not going to get involved in your life. I'm certainly not going to help you. Jude chapter 7 says that they used their free time for fornication. They had a lot of free time, abundance of idleness, so they just would have lots of sex. But when you study different kinds of groups, like Charles Manson's groups, for instance, the people who were in that group all had sex with one another. It didn't make any difference if he was a man or a woman or a woman or a man or what you were. Everybody in that group, to be in that group, had to have sex with everybody else. They had an abundance of idleness, this town did, but they followed and worshipped and bowed down to Satan. Everybody in that town said, bring out these angels that we might know who it is, but they could have cared less if it was male or female. They didn't use the word, bring out the men. They used the word, bring out the mortals. We don't know who they are, but bring them out. 
So now when we look at this story, we find out that God was disgusted with them because he had blessed that town. They were prosperous, they were rich, they were wealthy, but they wouldn't strengthen the hand of the needy. They wouldn't help those who had need of help. And so the final scripture I want to look at tonight is Isaiah 58. This is not about Sodom, but this is God's plan about the needy, about the homeless, the fatherless, the widow, the oppressed. God's got an attitude toward those people. And here's the attitude he says in Isaiah 58, verse 6. Is not this the fast that I've chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? God's plan is for people who are blessed by him to begin to help people who need help. Sodom could have done that, would not do it. Is it not to deal your bread to the hungry and that you bring the poor that are cast out into your house? And when you see the naked that you cover him and that you don't hide yourself from your own flesh, then shall your light break forth as the morning and your health speed, uh, spring forth speedily. So God's way is to be helpful and hospitable Satan's way is to kill, to destroy, to ruin, to separate. Well, I think we've looked at this pretty clearly. And uh, we see that if we will not be hospitable, we're in danger. If we won't take care of the needy, we're in danger. If we won't be helpful to the oppressed, we're in danger. Where in the word does it say Sodom was destroyed for the sin of homosexuality? It is simply not there. Amen. And he said, take hold of my covenant and I will be your God. Take hold of my covenant and with the angels trod if Keep my Sabbath and please me in your ways. I'll be your God and add unto you many, many days. Take hold of my covenant and 